I'm Elisa Parenti in Washington, and you're watching Bloomberg Technology. Let's start with a check of your first word news. President Trump is embarking on his second overseas trip as president in a tour that takes him through five Asian nations. The president addressed reporters before boarding Air Force One. He said he was disappointed in the Justice Department for not investigating Hillary Clinton and the Democrats after allegations in a memoir by an ex-DNC chair that the Clinton campaign manipulated the party. President Trump criticized a judge's decision today that Sergeant Bo Bergdahl will serve no prison time. The president tweeted remarks less than an hour after the White House declined to comment on the ruling. Bergdahl walked off his post in Afghanistan and fellow soldiers were wounded during the Army search for that sergeant. Nancy Pelosi continues her criticism of the GOP tax plan. The House Minority Leader spoke at a press conference in Washington today. Yesterday, as you know, the Republicans unveiled a, a terrible assault on opportunity for the middle class in, in America. The Republicans want you to believe they are cutting taxes on the middle class, but Republicans are plundering the middle class. Global News, 24 hours a day, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Elisa Parenti. This is Bloomberg, and Bloomberg Technology is next. I'm Brad Stone, in for Emily Chang. This is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up, a Bloomberg scoop. Another Broadcom bombshell just after announcing a big move back to the U.S. on Thursday. We'll break down its plans to acquire Qualcomm in a deal that could be the biggest takeover of a chip maker ever. Plus, Apple resets the smartphone market with the official launch of a $1,000 smartphone. We're covering this story from all angles as lines form around the world for the iPhone X. And the great Bitcoin debate. Is the cryptocurrency a boon or a bubble? We'll continue the conversation as Bitcoin hits 7,000 and its market cap crosses the $120 billion mark. But first to our lead. Bloomberg has learned that Broadcom is said to be seeking to acquire Qualcomm in a deal that could be worth more than $100 billion. This would be the largest deal ever for a chip maker. Shares of Qualcomm rose as much as 19%, the biggest intraday move since 2008. Broadcom also rose as much as 5%, valuing the company at $111 billion. As a major supplier to Apple, Broadcom said this week it will return its headquarters to the U.S. from Singapore. The company already lists San Jose, California as a corporate co-headquarters. So let's get straight into this with Ian King, who helped break the story for Bloomberg today. Also with me is Bloomberg Gadfly columnist Brooke Sutherland. Ian, first to you. This is an unsolicited bid by Broadcom for Qualcomm. What's the likelihood that this actually happens? As you know, we're still in the early stages here. It hasn't actually been submitted as far as we're aware. Tremendously complicated situation. So many things at play here. You, I mean, the basic thing to think about here is you've got Two companies that are already in the top 10 of semiconductor makers worldwide, they would be shooting up to number three. That's got to be something that regulators are going to be showing an interest in, got to be something that customers like Apple, like Samsung are going to be looking at and deciding whether they really want this to happen. So a number of steps that definitely have to be taken before this becomes a reality. Brooke, you recently wrote a gadfly column uh, saying that the, the theater from yesterday, Broadcom CEO Hock Tan was in the Oval Office in the, in the firm grip of President Donald Trump and announced the move of the headquarters from Singapore to the U.S. That that was actually all about what we're hearing about today. Tell, tell us why you think yesterday and today are connected. Well, you know, I think it's a big part of it. And I think, you know, the initial thought when this was announced that they were going to re-domicile in the U.S. was, okay, is this an attempt to smooth regulatory approval for uh, the bro brocade communications deal, which is still in front of CFIUS and Broadcom is trying to get approval for it. Now, if you're a U.S. company, you don't have to go through a CFIUS review. And, you know, I think this Qualcomm deal would have been virtually impossible if Broadcom was still based in Singapore. I mean, just looking at sort of the pushback that it already got on the brocade deal, you know, attempting to acquire a company that is, you know, multiples of that size by a long shot, a sort of U.S. titan of semiconductors, if you will, would have been just absolutely out of the question from the point of 
the view of a CFIUS review. Now, to Ian's point, I think you're still going to maybe see regulatory pushback on this, but it does get a lot easier if Broadcom is a U.S. company. Yeah, but Ian, Broadcom didn't become a U.S. company in the last 24 hours, right? So how much of yesterday was theater? Um, depends on who you speak to, but a, a lot of people were being somewhat cynical about what happened. As Brooke mentioned, there's the pending brocade situation. It already had a headquarters here. Avago, which is the company that sort of took over Broadcom and then re changed its name to Broadcom, was actually a division of Hewlett-Packard back in the day. Very complicated situation. A lot of facilities already here in the U.S. The government of Singapore comes out and says, you know what, this doesn't mean anything. They're not moving anybody anywhere. It's just a change in registration. So uh, there's certainly no shortage of cynicism about that that move. And okay, I think the this... other really interesting ahead, thing Brooke. is that, sorry, the other interesting thing is that even after they move to the U.S., their tax rate is maybe going to go up to 10, 12 percent at most. So they're not going to be paying, you know, the top, even the, the 20 percent that the Republicans are pushing in this tax plan. So, I mean, because they still get a significant amount of their revenue from China, from Asia. So, I mean, it, like Ian said, I mean, it's sort of a symbolic move to the U.S., but we're not talking about, you know, multiples of billions of dollars coming in and extra tax revenue were being invested in the U.S. beyond what Broadcom is already sort of doing. Ian, what does this mean for the smartphone owner, the iPhone owner? There, there's a Broadcom chip in yeah. the phone. There's a Qualcomm chip in the phone. That's correct, yes. I mean, I, I, as you know, the supply chain is very, very important to what Apple does, to whatever, what it's capable of bringing to the market. Same is also true of Samsung, arguably to a lesser extent because it, a lot of in what it uses, it makes itself. But particularly from Apple's point of view, a couple of huge components, the Wi-Fi and the cellular, really you have to rely on these companies. If they get together, is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? And Apple's already waging war against Qualcomm. You wrote that tremendous piece in Business Week earlier in the year about this ongoing lit litigation uh, to try to reduce Qualcomm's licensing stranglehold over yeah. the smartphone. Yeah, I mean, that's another one of the possible derivatives from this deal. Perhaps Broadcom has a better relationship with Apple, is more compliant as far as Apple's concerned than Qualcomm is. They get together, the Qualcomm stuff goes away, Apple gets the kind of deal it wants. Qualcomm shareholders get rid of this huge overhang which is stripping them of all of that licensing revenue and as we reported last week, potentially even chip orders as well. So it's a very complicated situation. Brooke, last question to you. If you're Intel, if you're Samsung or other rivals, how do you see this potential uh, deal between Broadcom and Qualcomm? Well, I mean, obviously, it is a massive deal. Like you said, the biggest, you know, chip maker combination ever. And so I think that does sort of change the playing field. But I think you also have to look at this as, are we reaching sort of a peak of craziness in semiconductor deal making? There has been so many deals across this sector. I mean, when you think about the fact that Qualcomm is still trying to close a $40 billion takeover of NXP, and then Broadcom is trying to close its brocade deal after buying the original, the U.S. Broadcom when it was still Avago. I mean, these are just deals piling on top of each other, and this is going to be extremely difficult to integrate all of this. And, you know, that may open up opportunities for Intel, these other people, to sort of take market share away while you have these two companies tied up on integrating multiple deals. Okay, Bloomberg's Brooke Sutherland, Ian King, thank you for joining us. Coming up, the highly anticipated iPhone 10 hit stores today, and CEO Tim Cook says the current quarter will be the biggest ever, thanks to its new product lineup. We'll discuss if Apple can keep up with demand next. And Bloomberg Technology is live streaming on Twitter. Check us out at Bloomberg Tech TV, weekdays at 5 p.m. in New York, 2 p.m. in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg. It's safe to say the demand for the iPhone 10 is high and expectations are even higher. Lines are forming around the world as Apple retail stores unveiled the new smartphone to the public. High demand for the device also boosted Apple stock, briefly tipping its market cap above $900 billion, a first for the U.S. company. Earlier today, the Daybreak America's team sat down with Loop Ventures co-founder and longtime Apple analyst Gene Munster and asked him about the company's growth. 
the growth rate for next year is probably going to be closer to 20% because we're going to have this big cycle. So that really kicks in. That's that iPhone 10, and, and that's why I think you're going to see this stock continue to move higher throughout the day here is that people are going to feel better about what next year looks like. Joining me now, Bloomberg Technologies' Mark Gurman, who managed to snag the new iPhone earlier. Welcome, Mark. What is that gleaming rectangle of uh, metal and plastic you're, and glass you're holding in, in your hand? Glass, and it's an iPhone 10. I have it here. I still have the plastic on it. I heard you were, you were having trouble activating that, and other customers were as well. What was going on? Yeah, that's right. We actually just posted a story earlier on the terminal about this, uh, but people were having issues on both Verizon and AT&T in terms of being able to activate the thing. Now, obviously, in order to use it, you need to activate it. That's one of the restrictions that are on these carrier-tied iPhones. Uh, some people are reporting now they're clearing their issues are clearing up. I actually called Verizon and had to have it manually activated, which is not the way it's supposed to work. The way it's supposed to work is you take it out of the box, you put it in your Info, Should be easier. Activates their tagline is it just works. I have to call and wait a few minutes on the phone. First world problems, not a big deal, but that's what it is. So. Well, you and our colleague Jing Cao monitored some of the lines outside Apple stores today. There are long lines. Does that tell us anything about demand for the iPhone 10? Tells us a lot about it excitement for the iPhone 10, which means that it's probably going to spur some demand. Uh, there's a lot of people who lined up, and I really haven't seen lines like this. And I've been following this since day one of the iPhone before that even. There haven't been lines like this since the first one in 2007, or maybe as well as the iPhone 4 in 2010. This is pretty new territory for people who've only been looking at Apple for the last four or five years or so. You know, they do, though, cultivate kind of questions around supply, right? They, they went out and they told customers to, quote, arrive early for the new phone. You know, there were questions about whether they would have enough. Do you think that they kind of orchestrate some of these lines because it is great theater? Oh, yeah, they definitely wanted lines. I mean, the way they look at these product launches is that they're like opening weekends for a new Star Wars or a new Batman movie, right? They want the lines. They want people to show their friends these new devices. They like doing viral marketing. They call it buzz marketing inside Apple. So that's all part of the plan. We had a story today that there were already scalpers outside the store in Hong Kong reselling iPhone 10s. You had a line in your story saying that the Apple store in New York had sent out Chinese speakers to talk to people in the line. And you just got a sense for, from some of those pictures that there were people in line who were there not to own an iPhone 10, that, but for more transactional reasons. How big of a contribution is this to the first day buzz that you, you basically have scalpers waiting to get their hands on this yeah every time Apple comes out with a wholly new redesigned product you're gonna see a lot of people um, from those Asian markets coming to the United States in order to buy them and resell them in Hong Kong it's more difficult to get an iPhone right now because some of them only are sold to the carriers tied to the carriers other places sell them in a sim free environment Hong Kong you can't buy them online right now so that creates more demand for the phone less supply so obviously there's room for the scalpers to make a little bit of a business out of this. Well, what do we know about the supply? Like, has the, there were questions of whether the supply chain could, you know, meet demand. Everybody in line today, did they get phones? The people who pre-ordered, will they get phones? So the supply appears so far to be surprisingly strong and resilient to the really high demand. The shipping times dropped down from five to six weeks to three to four weeks globally uh, as of last night, including in the U.S. and Canada. It started going down, down to three to four weeks in Italy and Germany, uh, in the U.K., but now it's three to four weeks everywhere, which is not bad. The question will be is how long does this three to four week shipping time last for? In two weeks from now, will it still say to three to four weeks? Then that's when we start to know the supply issues. In terms of people lining up, are they getting phones? Yes, everyone I talked to, everyone I saw on Twitter today did not leave the store empty handed. It's really amazing. Um, they, they, they do seem to have managed to, you know, there were questions when they were delaying it so far after the release of the, of the eight, you know, what, what, what was behind that? Would they have enough? Uh, and then they went and this week announced blockbuster earnings. I, guess, I mean, I guess the question is, you know, is, are, is there any question right now over whether Apple can still execute in this quarter or have they already resolved those questions? No, I think Tim Cook will get to keep his job. <laughs> but um, they're doing great, honestly. Like they, the revenue growth and the unit growth year over year for all their products as well as in all their different segments and markets, very impressive and very strong for this time of year for them. Well, Mark, the last question. The, the one number that jumped out at me was a 24% uh, quarter on quarter growth in the services business. You know, perennially kind of the question mark for Apple. Uh, and yet they seem to be executing in that area as well. Right, and what's interesting about that is that they didn't actually introduce any new services or features in that segment over the last quarter. Usually when they introduce a new product, you know, that you know hikes up what their revenues are, they didn't do that. So this is natural growth based on their existing product portfolio. 
Okay, iPhone 10 owner and Bloomberg Technology reporter Mark Gurman, thank you for joining us. Coming up, Bitcoin's never-ending surge. It's by far the largest cryptocurrency in the world. But even as its meteoric rise continues, naysayers are not going away. That's next. This is Bloomberg. percent of the S&P 500 members Matt Dean are signaling A story we're watching, Amazon is expanding up north. The company plans to open a new office in Vancouver, creating about 1,000 new jobs. Amazon plans to open the doors of the new office in 2020. All this while the company currently searches for a second North American headquarters. And now to a story we've been following all year, Bitcoin's wild ride. The world's leading cryptocurrency is currently over $7,000. That's nearly 650% jump since the year's start and it's dominating in cryptocurrency market cap. Right now, it's over 120 billion in total value. That's nearly 100 billion more than its top rival, Ethereum. But concerns remain about Bitcoin, from big banker doubters to talk of a bubble. To discuss the latest, I'd like to bring in Sony Singh, Chief Commercial Officer of Bit BitPay. Sony, uh, Sonny, welcome. Thanks, Brad. Thank you How for you joining us. Tell us what this incredible appreciation in Bitcoin <laughs> over the past weeks and months has done for you guys. So, great question. So, BitPay is the global leader in blockchain payments around the world, so we'll process over a billion dollars this year. Um, however, we've only increased 10 to 15 percent month over month. So, we don't grow up three, four X every six months the way the price of Bitcoin does, because we're actually solving real pain points around the world. So, a lot of people know us that we allow companies like Microsoft accept Bitcoin on their websites, but we also allow a lot of B2B transactions happen around the world. So Fortune 100 companies will use us to have their suppliers in Latin America or Asia pay their invoices to Europe or America where it's cheaper and quicker than a bank wire. And that's really not dependent on the price of Bitcoin, but it's actually solving a real pain point around the world. Okay, Coinbase, which is more B2C oriented, and they're saying they're signing up 100,000 yep. customers in 24 hours. You're saying there's a little bit more friction in, in your market. Our market's a little different because, again, we're dealing with suppliers and merchants and merchants that way. Um, but it's great because everyone that buys Bitcoin from Coinbase or from all these trading exchanges eventually needs to tri uh, pay for merchant purchase goods. And that will eventually flow through our system. So, again, we're processing a billion dollars right now. Um, the global market cap is 120 billion right now. So we want all that money to fall through BitPay's merchants eventually. Okay, one big change it seems to me recently is big institutions getting into cryptocurrencies and, and into Bitcoin. Uh, Bill Miller, formerly a leg Mason, bringing Bitcoin into his value fund, you know, showing amazing results as, as a result. Um, how, what kind of impact are the institutions having on, on the price? Yeah, I think the institutions are really the ones driving it up. So. They've been on the sidelines for a while, but when it started getting around $50 billion market cap, they started taking really notice. And then $70 billion, $100 billion, they all started jumping in because now it's a big enough market where they can actually play in it. So I met with a global billion dollar hedge fund the other day, and they started trading Bitcoin four months ago, and they now have a position over, over $100, $100 million right now. And you're starting to see where family offices, hedge funds around the world are now starting to allocate a small amount of their portfolio to Bitcoin. And again, but since it's global and all these different hedge funds and family offices are involved, that 1% that they might allocate towards it starts adding up quite a bit. The big question, legitimate asset or bubble waiting to explode? Uh, I think it depends on the use case around the world. So again, we have a development team in Argentina and they get all of their 100% of their salary in Bitcoin because they prefer Bitcoin over their local currency actually. On the B2B use case we talked about, it's solving a real pain point where it's cheaper quicker than a bank wire. People use it as a digital gold, so to speak, right? 
in America, it's not much as a pain point, but people are using it more as a you know asset allocation method. So you're seeing different pain points around the world that people are using Bitcoin for. So again, I don't know about the price of it as much, but I think the use cases are definitely there, and that's what you're saying to see this growth happening around there the world. There is a pervasive criticism, though, that transaction times are slow, uh, that there's not you know that, that there's you know there's not much you can do with it other than sort of hold it. Um, you know, Jamie Diamond, obviously a big and persistent critic of Bitcoin. I mean, what do you make of, of the criticism? So, so we help some of the largest law firms in, the, in America actually accept Bitcoin from their international clients. We recently went live with the largest, one of the largest real estate development shops in New York City called Magnum Real, real Estate Group. And they're allowing Bitcoin for their international clients or their tech savvy people. So yes, a Bitcoin transaction might take an hour, but that's still cheaper and quicker than a bank wire from Singapore or Hong Kong, right? Um, so Jamie Dimon and all of them getting involved, it shows that Bitcoin is starting to take notice, actually. It's getting big enough where the banks are starting to wonder what's happening. He said people real. who buy the currency called them stupid. <laughs> Again, not my developers in Argentina. They're having a great time as Bitcoin price appreciates and their local currency keeps going down. So it depends, again, where you're located in the world and what your reason for buying it is. Okay, this week, Sonny, I noticed that Amazon registered three domains related to cryptocurrencies. Does Amazon start accepting Bitcoin soon, do you think? No, I don't think so. Because it doesn't really solve a pain point for them. Because Amazon, again, is moving global amounts of currency, let's say, in the States alone. They still have to add on other payment methods that are worth more than $100 billion. Now, I could see Amazon maybe accepting Bitcoin for AWS billing payments in Brazil or Argentina, where someone might not have a credit card in Brazil that could pay the AWS bill that would be accepted. Okay, I, I don't hope to understand this, but I'll ask it anyway. There's a f upcoming fork, fork yes. right? A code upgrade, Segwit 2X. Very quickly, you know, what, what does it mean? Could it be a problem for Bitcoin and people who hold it? Yeah, so what, what I think what's happening is that you're seeing a lot of people doing a flight to quality. So a lot of people are actually weaving other currencies like Ethereum or other altcoins and buying into Bitcoin for this upcoming fork and hoping that they might get another currency that might get created, similar to what happened with Bitcoin Cash a couple months ago. So hopefully the fork goes well and transaction times will start being quicker and cheaper, actually, and that's what we hope for. Okay, Sunny Singh, Chief Commercial Officer of BitPay, thank you for joining us. Thanks, Brad. Coming up, as the self-driving competition heats up, we'll take a deeper dive into the hands-free technology driving autonomous vehicles. This is Bloomberg. For our viewers worldwide, this is Bloomberg Daybreak. How mindful are you of the possibility of what the markets talk about as a trade war? We've been in a trade war for decades. The next two years are going to be very uncertain. So you have Brexit uncertainty. To use your word, you have Trumponomics uncertainty. They have been front and center in selling assets to help their debt, but now it's going to be about growth. I'm Mark Crumpton in New York. You're watching Bloomberg Technology. Let's begin with a check of first word news. President Trump says he's disappointed the Justice Department isn't doing enough to investigate Hillary Clinton and the Democratic National Committee. The president again denied any connection between his campaign and Russia. There was no collusion. There was no nothing. It's a disgrace, frankly, that they continue. You ought to look at Hillary Clinton and you ought to look at the new book that was just put out by Donna Brazil, where she basically bought the DNC and she stole the election from Bernie. So that's what you ought to take a look at. And that new book by former interim Democratic National Committee Chair Donna Brazil alleges Clinton's campaign controlled DNC strategy and finances before she secured the presidential nomination. The Associated Press reports that current and former congresswomen are alleging they were sexually harassed by unnamed male colleagues. Former California Congresswoman Mary Bono tells the AP she endured suggestive comments from a fellow lawmaker who still serves in Congress. Bono and others say the incident 
incidents occurred years or even decades ago. A Spanish judge on Friday issued international search and arrest warrants for ousted Catalan leader Carles Puigdemont and his aides. Puigdemont is in Belgium after he and his cabinet were removed from office last week for illegally declaring Catalonia's independence from Spain. Eight former Catalan officials were jailed on Thursday. Former Greek finance minister Yanis Varoufakis discussed the future of Europe during an interview with Bloomberg Television. Varoufakis, who's written a new book called Adults in the Room, My Battle with the European and American Deep Establishment, said that in the wake of Germany's September 24th election, Chancellor Angela Merkel is in trouble. Angela Merkel is an extremely weakened leader at the moment because she has to form a government with a, a political party whose number one and maybe only promise to its electorate uh, is that they will stop Emmanuel Macron from uh, tabling uh, and having accepted by Angela Merkel the proposition that leads us towards a common budget. Varoufakis added he believes what ails the European Union can be fixed by a common budget. Meantime, Chancellor Merkel continues her push to form a coalition government after initial talks produced little progress. Merkel said Friday she remains, in her words, optimistic about her conservative union bloc finding common ground with pro-business free Democrats and the left-leaning Greens. Global News 24 hours a day, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. In New York, I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Technology. I'm Brad Stone. Competition in the autonomous vehicle industry continues to heat up. One company is looking to push its technology to the growing market. MIT spin-off Optimus Ride developed self-driving technologies and just announced an $18 million Series A funding round led by Graycroft Partners. Joining me now from Boston is Ryan Chin, Optimus Ride CEO, and in New York, John Elton of Graycroft Partners. Gentlemen, thanks for joining me. Uh, Ryan and Boston, let's start with you. T tell me about Os Optimus Ride and what you guys bring to a very competitive and crowded market. Yeah, our view is that we want to provide sustainable, safe, equitable mobility. Our, we develop fully autonomous vehicles, and this new investment with uh, Gregcroft allows us to enable the scaling and testing and validation of our product. And our goal is, of course, to get to a commercial product. That's really, the, I would say, one of the key things we're focusing on. So, Ryan, like Uber, like Waymo, you guys developed the entire solution. We develop full stack autonomy, so level four autonomy, where we look at not only the sensing, but we also uh, do perception, we do uh, control, planning, uh, and actuation of the vehicle. Uh, and that allows us to also coordinate with fleets of vehicles. So we focus a lot on shared electric autonomous vehicles. Do you, do you have tests up and running now? Yeah, we've been testing here uh, in Boston in the seaport, the self-driving testing area for the city, which we helped to establish part of the formation of the company. Uh, and we've been driving and testing and uh, obviously working with the uh, Massachusetts DOT. Uh, and we have uh, approval to test uh, on public roads here in Massachusetts. Okay, John Elton of Graycroft. Lots of big, mean companies in this space. <laughs> tell, tell me why you backed, backed <clears throat> Optimus Ride. Well, all the, all the investments we make are in you know, competitive spaces. We got really excited about Optimus Ride because they have a world-class technical team out of MIT. Ryan was at the MIT Media Lab, and then they've got a number of engineers that came out of the DARPA Urban Challenge at MIT. And then the second thing is they've really got the right approach. So that by focusing on, on private land, which is what they do, they limit the problem parameters so they can get to full autonomy a lot faster. Tell me what that means. I don't quite, I don't, I don't quite understand. Like, what, what so, piece of the technology have they figured out that others have not? Well, I'll, I'll let Ryan speak to the technology parameters, but by, by limiting the problem, what you allow in, in any sort of leap of technology, what you do is you, you limit some of the parameters. And, and on private land, you can do things like lower the speed limit, add uh, physical things to the environment. And so it makes things go a lot better and, and be and work in real life conditions very fast. For example, in full autonomy without private land, if it starts raining or you have these other things, it can be, it, it just won't work. Whereas in private land, you can take a number of natural steps to make, make sure it's, it works. 
I see. So, Ryan, do you see deploy that this technology gets deployed first in like private residences or theme parks or golf courses? Well, my view is that as any area that you can uh, constrain the problem allows you to test uh, very quickly and be able to move to a completely driverless solution. Right. So our view is that when you get to a completely driverless, meaning no test drivers on board, then you get to get the user feedback, which is ne needed once you have that person out of the loop. And for us, that feedback allows us to not only uh, be able to test user interfaces, but also to get to a level of autonomy where the vehicle could basically go from one place, one point within a, within a geography to another very seamlessly. And that allows us to get to, I would say, high data velocity, which is completely necessary for driving, uh, essentially driving towards a, a fully autonomous solution because you need that kind of high, high density of data in order to improve your driving algorithms. Ryan, this is a market where everyone appears to be choosing sides. In fact, sometimes they're choosing one, more than one side. Google invested in Uber and then more recently invested in Lyft. So who do you guys see as your most natural partners? Well, we need to partner with all different groups, right? You need to have a vehicle manufacturer. You need to work with insurance companies. You need to have partners to deploy and scale. All of those are necessary, but our view is that we have a lot of that already in place. And in fact, we will be making announcements uh, in the next several weeks about some of these partnerships and clients that we're working with. John Elton, do you see Optimus Ride in this team as a potential acquisition target? Uh, certainly, th there's already been a number of acquisitions in the space for very large numbers. But really, the beauty of Optimus Ride is it's a team that's really uh, hell bent on building the future and that will be a fully autonomous cars. They will help design the communities of the future and it'll bring, uh, be much more environmentally friendly. It'll be safer. It'll be much more uh, accommodating to all, all people, blind people, people of lower income, be more affordable. And the, co the company and the team really want, are, are dedicated to this and are in for, it the, for the long haul. Okay, John, staying with you, let me ask you about Tesla. Right, right at the forefront of the future of mobility, not a great week for Tesla. Obviously, delays in the rollout of the Model 3. You know, what, what does it mean for Tesla? What does it mean for the, the future of this whole category and the future of autonomy? Well, Tesla's problems have really been on the production line, and there have been an, a number of articles about the challenges, the number of employees per car produced. Um, I, I think Tesla has a very bright future. They're investing in it. We're at the cusp of a, a incredible time where machine learning, AI, enables cars to drive themselves. And what that will unlock for the future is really hard to, you know, re really hard to picture today. There's so much that depends on transportation. About 50% of, of a city's landscape is dedicated to cars, parking, all these things. What will that look like in the future? I think it'll be very different, and I think Tesla plays a big part in that, and we'll eventually get through these production difficulties. Ryan, I'll, I'll give the last question to you. The traditional automakers, Ford, GM, Toyota, they're all working on the solution. Uh, you know, do, they, do they have the assets to, to play to be leaders in the future of mobility? Well, my view is that there are only certain numbers of teams that actually can do this. And certainly the OEMs and car manufacturers have a, have a good start. If you go back to the DARPA challenge from 2007, there are basically six teams that finished that race. Two of our co-founders were part of the MIT team that finished the race. There were probably another half dozen or so that actually f uh, didn't finish the race as well. So if you think about the total global talent pool around self-driving, it's really about a dozen or 20 companies or so. And you think about that, that's probably 400 people that have pioneered this technology over that t uh, period of time, have tested it, have worked on it for over a decade. So our view is that there's actually a very small talent pool that can actually deploy self-driving vehicles. And certainly working with, par partnering with car companies or even being acquired by them is certainly, you know, we've seen that being played out in the field. Our view is that this community being very strong is important for not only growing the, the industry itself, but also establishing different markets within that. Okay, fascinating. Ryan Chin, Optimus Ride CEO, and John Elton of Graycroft Partners. Thanks, Brad. Thank you both for joining us. Great, thank you. Twitter says it has implemented safeguards to prevent future account deactivations. This comes after President Trump's account was taken down for 11 minutes on Thursday evening, which Twitter attributed to an exiting employee. The company tweeted, quote, we won't be able to share all details about our internal investigation or updates, but we take this seriously and our teams are on it. 
coming up. Silicon Valley's move from the Capitol to the courtroom. What's in store for big tech's legal battles in 2018? This is Bloomberg. Lawyers from three of Silicon Valley's top tech firms spent a lot of time on Capitol Hill this week. But come 2018, they'll be back in their natural habitat, the courtroom. Governments across the, across the globe will be looking to get legislation passed on a wide variety of topics, from ending tax loopholes to eliminating trafficking, how they deal with hate speech, and much more. Joining me to discuss this is Bloomberg's Garrett DeVink in Toronto, who's written a piece on big tech's possible court battles to come. Garrett, thanks for joining. There does seem to be so much noise right now about big tech, regulation, the election. And my question to you is, is this an anomaly? Is it going to be back to normal for 2018 where they get a free pass? Or is this kind of scrutiny here to stay? I mean, it definitely thinks it definitely seems that we're sort of in a new normal, so to speak. I mean, big tech has faced regulations in China and Europe, you know, for years now. But now that it's coming to the U.S., which is still their largest market in terms of revenue for most of these companies, and obviously where they're based and sort of where their leadership is kind of emotionally centered, you know, it looks like it's just going to continue to heat up. And qu kind of the takeaway here is that you know the tech companies can no longer argue that they're just part of the neutral internet and sort of platforms for people to go out and do and say whatever they want, they're actually going to have responsibility for seeking out and policing and reporting and dealing with bad behavior happening on their, on their platforms. Okay, you and, and Peter Coy have a great graphic illustrating this on Bloomberg.com, points to all the legal challenges that these companies are likely to face in 2018. And if you have to pick the biggest one, the most existential threat, what are we going to be talking about next year? Well, there's a really interesting thing going on right now because what we, you know, up until maybe today even, we thought the biggest one was going to be a long bill that's coming out in the U.S. Congress that tries to limit um, sex trafficking on online platforms. And it would kind of upend some of the orthodoxy around the internet which says you know platforms are not responsible for the things that people do on them now we saw today the internet association which represents google twitter facebook other major internet companies saying they would actually support that legislation you know we're not exactly sure what it's going to look like in in specific details but it does show that you know maybe what we thought was going to be one of the legal legal biggest legal battles you know there may be some compromise that they could work out that's remarkable. Does that mean we're going to see tech companies regulated more like news organizations? I mean, I think that's probably maybe not so, we probably don't want to go that far. I mean, obviously some lawmakers see it that way. We saw in the UK Prime Minister uh, saying that, you know, she wants to do things that way. Even some of the lawmakers this, this week at, at the US Congress were saying, you know, you're publishers. You publish things all the time. And the tech companies were kind of pushing it back. But, you know, that might be the next front. Okay, what do you think we'll see in the courts next year as it relates to H-1B visas and DACA, and how might that impact the workforces of the, of the Silicon Valley companies? That's going to be a big fight because we know this, this, that immigration is an issue that's very close to the heart of the tech companies. Immigration is very important for their workforce. And also, you know, as the CEOs, as they try to say to their employees that they support them, they need to kind of go out publicly. They've said a lot of things in support of, you know, DACA, which is, you know, those who were brought into the U.S. undocumented when their children grew up as Americans and are now working at some of these companies. And H-1Bs, which is a, a visa program for people to come work at tech companies. We're not sure exactly what's going to happen. The Trump administration has had a lot of angry words about it, but we don't know exactly what's going to happen in the new year. But it's definitely a place where we are going to see how strongly the tech companies are going to stand behind their words in terms of bringing legal action against the government and trying to defend their employees who may be under some of these uh, visa regimes. Last question for you, Garrett. As, as you and Peter Coy looked at the legal landscape of the big tech companies, how large did antitrust loom? Do you think that you know what we've seen in the UK, in the uh, EU, with antitrust uh, authorities scrutinizing Google in particular? Do you, do you see? Do you think we see the needle move in the U.S. on antitrust enforcement? 
The needle has definitely moved in terms of the conversation, and antitrust earlier in the year was probably the, the noisiest of all these noisy conversations. But when it comes down to it, it really doesn't look like there is going to be a real change in U.S. antitrust policy as we know it you know, at any time soon. It's very difficult to see, um, you know, conservative Republican lawmakers really changing it to move from the standard of what's best for the consumer is what we're going to go for. And right now, free products from Google, Facebook, you know, low prices on Amazon. Consumers generally like those products. Okay, Bloomberg's Garrett DeVink. Thank you. Coming up, Aquantia is the second chip maker to launch an IPO in the U.S. this year, despite an explosion of growth in semiconductors. We'll hear from the company's CEO next. This is Bloomberg. Shares of Aquantia, a maker of chips that control high-speed data cables, climbed in the first day of trading after pricing its IPO below estimates. Bloomberg News IPO reporter Alex Barinka caught up with Faraj Ali, CEO of Aquantia at the New York Stock Exchange. Take a listen. Well, this process, quite honestly, is, is as much a process of getting a, 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 a number for the price, but as well as picking the investors you want in your book. And we basically went with quality and then just quantity because I think the quantity in the open market, the market will decide what this company is worth. And given what we've accomplished and, and what we have in front of us, I think the market will reward our performance. You know, and it's not just about one day this thing, it's about the long term, right? So when I think about Aquantia, a chip maker, a lot of chip makers out there, tell us exactly what you do, what do you provide to your clients in terms of semiconductors? Here's what's different about us. So if you think about every which way you use internet, it puts a lot of data into these networks. These networks now have bottlenecks. So our company very simply removes those bottlenecks, whether they're in data centers at, at, you know, at the hyperscale guys or in your corporate data center, at your workplace where you have mobility devices. The, the mobile speeds are increasing to such a point where it makes the 15-year-old technology that was the backbone of these mobile networks useless. So what we provide is a multi-gig capability and we're very, very few companies in the world that actually have the expertise to deliver what we do and we lead this market. Now, to tell you how big this market is, a billion ports of Ethernet ship every year with the speed that has been there for the last 16, 17 years. And our job is to actually convert every one of those to a multi-gig capability that gives the user better experience as they surf the internet. So uh, looking at who is buying uh, your products, Cisco, Cisco and Intel are two of your biggest customers. Talking to some of my sources on the street, they're a little bit concerned that there's so much saturation in those two customers. What's your growth strategy going forward and how do you maintain those two very important relationships? Very good question. If you're a networking connectivity company, the number one goal for you as a company is to serve Cisco and Intel because they have such huge market share. So the success means you win both of them. The flip side is you get some customer concentration. So you have to have a longer term strategy of how you diversify. So we've been going out and diversifying into basically computing industry, into providing devices to the service provider market. And as you see that part of our business continue to grow, that will naturally diversify the revenue from this company. We've got tremendous growth ahead of us. Analysts have us with 20 plus percent growth year over year. This is in an industry that grows five to 6% a year, right? And looking further beyond that is, we want to be the solution provider for autonomous driving cars. So we will provide the fundamental structure, multi-gig structure, that will make an autonomous driving car, frankly, viable. And that's really our longer-term goal that will double or triple the size of the market that we address. Uh, when I think about uh, diversity, a lot of the big chip makers have also been diversifying, and they've been doing it through acquisitions. Right. There's one truism about your industry, it's that M&A is here to stay. Why did you all go public instead of potentially consider uh, being gobbled up by one of these big chip makers? Um, so our investors have invested nearly $200 million in this company, and the company is 13 years old. We have a history of, of battling the big guys and beating them at, at, at the game and being two to three years ahead of them. So that investment is now starting to pay off. The products in our products in enterprise are starting to grow 30% plus a year. We've now come into this market we call Access, which is client computing and service provider market. That has started to grow. So our investors feel that 
tremendous growth, year over year, multi growth uh, ahead of multi year growth ahead of us, will actually increase the value of this company. You're absolutely right. M and A is, is is here to stay in semiconductor industry, and you know as we deliver on the promise of being a standalone powerful company that can really lead three markets that are growing significantly, we think there'll be a lot of interest in this company. But our goal. My philosophy in building companies is build it to stand on its own. And if somebody wants to come and acquire it, well, you can have a business conversation at that point. Uh, you have flirted with profitability. Uh, not quite there yet, uh, but is that a number one concern for you? How do you think about the bottom line, which is so valued by investors, especially in enterprise tech these days? Yeah, so we want to be in 20 to 30 percent range, 25 to 30 percent range, frankly, um, in terms of op you know operating income. Um, but we think that this time for us is important to invest in these new technology areas, hyperscale data centers. They they like to go to 100 gig per lane technology. We're probably the only company in the world that can provide that, and that's an area we've invested in. We see the autonomous driving cars, which, as I said, can double or triple the size of our our, our opportunity, and we've decided to invest in that. That was Faraj Ali, CEO of Aquantia, speaking to Bloomberg's Alex Barinka. And that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. A reminder that we are live streaming on Twitter. Check us out at Bloomberg Tech TV weekdays at 5 p.m. in New York, 2 p.m. in San Francisco. That's all for now. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.